We are back on the Rational Boomer podcast. Hopefully your day is going well. It is Thursday, and I got a surprise for you. We've got a guest. That's not a surprise, but we've got a guest you've never seen before or heard before. This gentleman has sent in emails. I've read the emails before. He finally conjured up enough courage to come on, and I explained to him it's not that big a deal. It's not that hard. There's nothing to be worried about. But who we have with us today is a gentleman by the name of Cress. C-R-E-S-S, and he's from Central Illinois. Gress, welcome to the show. Thanks, Mike. Nice to meet you. What uh, I, I'm curious, I always ask this of people, and uh, I don't mean this in the egomaniacal sense, but what drew you to the whole rational boomer bullshit? I mean, when I started this, nobody knew who I was and uh, what I was talking about what was it that caught your interest and got you involved sending emails and listening and that sort of thing? Well, uh, a couple of years ago, we decided to move to Florida mm -hmm. and like everybody else, uh, you know, retired, my mm -hmm. wife can work from home. So we decided to go down there and move and it ended up being Trump fuck land. And I started just, I'm retired. I'm going through my phone. I'm looking to podcasts. I'm watching this and that and the other. And I dumb found, Luck crossed you and been listening to you ever since. Well, I and appreciate then... I appreciate that immensely. Uh, <clears throat> that's been as big a surprise to me as anybody that we've been able to get as many people listening to the TikToks and the podcast and all the rest. Um, but that was the point of doing this. Wasn't that I was some guy that's super smart and that's pontificating it was just trying to stir shit up to get people of a like mind together so when you and the others come together that really was the goal here because with more people we have a louder voice and if there was ever a time we need a loud voice it's this motherfucking time right now yes it sure is it's it's crazy i was uh, we were going to talk a little bit about florida because i visited there over the weekend oh okay yeah please do and um, we flew into Florida or into Orlando on Friday afternoon and drove from Orlando to Cocoa Beach and then uh, spent a couple of days there and then went to drove to Miami to the football game and then drove back and flew home on Monday. But I wanted to talk about there was no Trump stuff out hardly at all. I well, didn't believe that there was no si side shows of the sell of the flags and the and the signs and the t-shirts and the red hats and no red hats no no bullshit at all i couldn't believe it no trucks with flags in them it was unbelievable well that's that's interesting i, I was going to ask you about that for what your perception of that is you were spending time or living in florida when the trump lefuck uh, period was going hot and heavy and uh for, so for you looking at florida even as a visitor now you you're noticing some discernible differences in what florida once was and what it was what it is now oh i think florida is going to be blue I, do you what i know what i saw yeah because before when i when we lived there everybody on the corner they had a tent set up every day they were selling trump flags like i say people had them hanging off the back of their trucks they were you know confederate flags everywhere stickers you know i mean they had them hanging from their flagpoles. It was everywhere there. And that's just almost nothing now. You see a few scattered here and there, little signs, maybe an old flag or, you know, very little. Well, as an older guy, I, I assume, I, I, well, I know because you told me you're you're about my age in the roughly in the same area. Um, we're even seeing uh, the villages, something we older folks know about. It's a place for people 55 and above and it's been notoriously red and and trump lefucks down there even that seems to be making a dramatic change over the last six eight months well you know you talked about that too but when we moved down there they were talking about a thousand families a week were moving to florida but you yeah. got to realize you got to realize a lot of those families were from illinois and minnesota and some in new york and california a lot of blue states, so you have a lot of blue people moving down into a red Good state point. too. You know, so you have that's what the villages is. That they're not they're not homegrown Floridians there in the villages. They're all immigrants from other states. You know, I mean, they're just well, as somebody who was a resident of Florida, 
my perception being on the outside, I live in Minnesota. I have a place in Savannah, Georgia. I do fly into Florida now and again. But do you think the current state of Florida, the political state, you know, the state with the insurance, uh, the situation with the immigrants and not enough employees to build houses and put roofs on, do you think the current state of Florida is having some impact on how people are deciding to vote, that he, maybe even some Republicans are going, this is becoming intolerable. We need a change. Well, when DeSantis ran for president, everybody in the country showed you what they what they thought of him. Yeah. You know, I mean, I mean he, what he won, won 2 percent on every primary that he was in, hardly right. anything at all. So, I mean, and he's losing ground in Florida, too, because of all the, the abortion ban. You know, he tried to uh, have the health. Was it the health department? The head of the health department attorney sent the the uh, new, uh, stations that were showing the ads about the abortion ban, about the bill or the the vote, was having them threaten, you know, to take their FCC license away or some shit like that. <laughs> That's crazy. They can't do that. Yeah. Well, you know what I mean? He was trying to do so. I don't know what he was trying to do, but he was trying to do some kind of bullshit like that, you know. Well, so, they, they they just say anything and hoping to scare people, even though they know that it will never happen. I mean, this is what Donald Trump does. This is what Ron DeSantis does. They make these crazy claims that they can't back up, but they're just hoping people get it in the narrative and start to believe it. And unfortunately, there are some dumb fucks that do believe it. Oh, well, there's a lot of dumb fucks out there that believe it. And I don't know whether is it is it are they that dumb or are they just no fucking common sense? You know, I think there's a lot of people who hear something they want to hear, and then they rationalize it out. You know, even if they know it's not possible, they hear somebody with authority say it and say, well, maybe it's possible. Yeah, that's what I want. I'm with him on that. And I, I think there's a lot of that to it. But to continually do that shows a certain amount of ignorance. Oh, yeah. I had, a, I had an older gentleman come up to me at the gas station the other day in the small town I live in. It's about 4,500 people I live in now. Um, and a guy that I've ran into several times, and we just kind of chit-chat a little bit. And he goes, I hope you voted red. And I was like, why is that? And he goes, aren't you getting ready to draw Social Security? And I said, yeah, I'll get my first check in December. And he said, well, if she gets to office, they're going to start taxing our Social Security by 80%. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm like 80%. And then I just turned around and walked away from him. I just couldn't even, I, he's a nice guy. I just couldn't even say anything to him. I just didn't know what to say. Well, and it wouldn't do any good. You could give him facts and show him evidence and he would never believe it. He'll only believe what a pathological liar will tell them. And you're not a pathological liar, so you don't fit the bill. I mean, but you, well, you live in Illinois. It's a notoriously blue state. But when you get to some of the central or southern parts of Illinois in the rural areas, I got to think there's a fair amount of red down there. Oh, it's red. It's really red where I live. And I have a I have a Kamala Harris sign in my front yard. And and uh, I, I told Heather, my wife tonight, I said, you know that if he wins and he's talking about the enemy within, because we have that sign, there'll probably be somebody knocking on our door someday. And she and she said. Oh, they wouldn't do that. I said, I wouldn't be surprised if anything they wouldn't do if he got elected. Well, I I, I can assure you this, and uh, that's one of the things I want to talk about. He's not going to win. There, there, there make, there's no logical sense that suggests he's going to win. Polls be damned. I don't listen to the polls because the polls are always wrong. It's just a big ploy, a big game. It's like bookies or or prize fight promoters trying to make this look like a battle of the Titans. And when it comes down to it, you know, you bring up Florida, people talk about Texas and some other States. I think Florida probably has the best chance of flipping blue because of all the factors, the abortion ban, the abortion question being on the ballot, the, the, the marijuana thing being on the ballot, how badly things are going down in Florida. I think it has a real chance of flipping blue. And if that happens, it's fucking done. Well, and then they were just talking. I just read somewhere where there's 1.1 Puerto Ricans that live in Florida too. So yeah. if half of those are if half of those are registered voters, that might be a half a, a half a million more votes on blue on the blue side, or should be. Yeah, and and if the Puerto Ricans in Florida don't get them, the Haitians will. Oh yeah, 
And and it seems to me the villages in Central Florida is going after Rick Scott and the rest of those. You know, he's wanting to, he's saying that uh, Social Security and, and uh, Medicare is an entitlement program. That's all fine and dandy for those people that are rich. But uh, but you and I that paid into it all these years, we kind of want to draw some of it back out, I would think. I'll tell you what, I took mine as soon as I possibly could. And people say, well, you shouldn't do that. I said, look, I'm in a fortunate position because I have a pension too. I didn't have to take it, but I thought one thing I learned about being in business, when the money's available, you take it now because you don't know what's going to happen six months, eight months, a year from now. I want the money now. Now, granted, I'm not getting as much as if I waited till I'm 67, but I could be dead at 67 and maybe I only live to 68. I'm going to get as much money as I can. So I'm getting it early. Yeah, my first check, I am uh, I just turned 62 in the first part of October. So I get my first one in December. And what I was always told, you're not guaranteed any of those checks. You take them when you can. Right. Yeah. I took it at 62 as well. And uh, I would have people will argue about this all over the place. Well, you should wait till this. Should, fuck that. Give me my money. Yep. Give me my yeah. fucking money before somebody tries to take it away. But I will tell you this, Chris. Um, I've said all along that the biggest issue in this upcoming election is the abortion issue. And I said in yesterday's podcast, um, if you think the abortion issue is a big issue in this campaign, fuck with Medicare and Social Security. That will absolutely destroy any party that wants to try to do that because it affects not just women and some men, it affects everybody. And there's a lot of boomers in this country that count on Social Security. Uh, I don't think anything's ever going to happen to Social Security or Medicare, mainly because it would be devastating to the country and devastating to any party that does it. And besides that, Donald Trump can't fucking win and Kamala Harris will be fine with Social Security and Medicare. Oh, I I, I don't think she's going to touch it either. And she's talking about expanding Medicare to, to in-home care for the elderly. I mean, you can't take care of yourself. At least somebody will come by and help you a little bit. You know, when I was talking to you before, before we went on, I think you and I have the same mindset at our age, regardless of who won the presidency, it probably wouldn't affect us as much because we're kind of our lives. The remainder of our lives are pretty much set social security, pensions, investments, whatever. Nothing's really going to change because we're not going to be looking for jobs or anything like that. But it sounds like with you and the same as for me, I'm feeling like this is the last fight in order to leave the house clean for my kids and my grandkids. That's really the most important thing for me. Yeah. Like I told you before, I have two daughters, a stepdaughter. I have uh, uh, four granddaughters and a step granddaughter. I have two nieces and two great nieces. And that's why I voted blue up and down all the way. I, you know, I, I don't want to see one of those, you know, one of those girl, little girls get married someday and move to Georgia and God forbid something happen and not be able to get the care and end up dying of sepsis or any other thing because they couldn't get reproductive care. That is just crazy. There was a story out of Texas yesterday. And when I say yesterday, Chris, it's kind of today, but this show will be be playing on Thursday. We're doing this Wednesday night. Um, but this woman had a miscarriage and the OBGYN at that point felt or was concerned that they would be charged with something if they dealt with this woman. She struggled with this miscarriage and whatever comes along with it, maybe sepsis, that sort of thing for 40 hours. And then she died. There is no reason in the world this woman should have died if not for the Republicans and their bullshit laws. That's one of the things we're fighting for. You and I aren't going to have kids anytime in the future, but our kids and our grandkids and our great grandkids will. And to leave them with that kind of mess, that kind of turmoil that's absolutely unnecessary is just unconscionable to me. I just don't understand how that state shouldn't turn blue too for all the bullshit that's going on down there. I mean, you've got Greg Abbott and, What's the attorney general? He's always trying to pull his bullshit all the time. Paxton, too, yeah. 
packs. Yeah, Ken you, know, Paxton. you know, you know, why isn't why aren't these people just wising up and going fuck this and let's get this bullshit out of the way? A lot of people say Texas can turn blue, uh, and I, I think that's distinctly possible. I just have the less confidence in Texas just because of the personalities we're dealing with down there. I can see Florida turning blue possibly because of all that's going on. I just I just see a lot of people in Texas pushing back against this and reelecting fucking Ken Paxton and reelecting Greg Abbott. I think the first chip to fall will be when um, when uh, Ted Cruz loses. And I think he will lose. And hopefully that will be a sign of the state turning blue. And if it can turn blue this time around, then Donald Trump's truly done. Uh, yeah, Colin Allred, isn't he a great, he's a great candidate against Ted Cruz. They couldn't ask for a better candidate against him. I mean, no. he just, he just beat him in debate <laughs> after, you know, I mean, Ad after ad, everything. He's just he's doing everything right. Well, and the thing about him, one of the reasons he's going to do well is because while he's a Democrat, he's not an ultra liberal. He's more moderate. And if Republicans are going to switch to the Democrats, they're going to need somebody like him to not go way left, somebody who's going to be in the middle. And it does seem like that's what Colin Allred is. Yeah, he seems like he seems like a pretty normal kind of guy, you know, ex-military, been in the House of Representatives for a little while. I mean, he kind of knows how Washington runs. Right. I think he'd be a great I think he'd be a great senator for Texas. He was born and raised in Texas. You know, I mean, he knows the people. Let, let, let me ask you this, Chris. Um, every day, all day, I get people in my DMs and my emails and my comments just terrified about what's going on. And they always look to the polls. Oh my God, the polls say this, the polls say that. Are you one of these people that worry about this or how do you feel about this upcoming election? Well, I'm glad she said something about that because uh, Arlene Unfiltered, I I watch her TikToks and I just, you know, I've been working so I haven't had a chance to watch too much TikTok. So I came, when I got home tonight a little bit early, I ran through it real quick and she has a really good TikTok about polling. On yeah. today, I mean, and she, you can't trust them. You can't trust. I knew you can't trust polls. You're, you know, I, I've heard you say over and over again, look at where the money's coming from. Look, yeah. who's, look, look who's getting all the donations. Because like you say, if I reach into my pocket and pull out a $10 bill, that's my 10, my money that I hard earned. And I give it to her because I want her to be the pre next president of the United States. It's not, you know, I mean, that, that says a lot more than, and when she was talking on her podcast or on her TikTok, she said that uh, they only poll people that have landmines. Right. And then she said, typically, um, the people that have landlines are older and typically they will answer the phone when it rains. Right. So, right. so, you know, you're never getting the whole demographic of every, you know, of every, every age group, you know, color, race. I mean, the whole, you don't get, you just get whoever you get. Well, you've got these hundreds of thousands of new voters that are just coming of age right now. You know, they're not getting a call. I don't have a landline. I'm an old guy, but I don't have a landline. And if I get a call from a number I don't know, I don't answer it. I do get text messages now and again, asking for money, maybe to answer some questions, but I'm not going to answer the questions because the problem with the polls are who owns them? What are the questions they're asking? And if you've ever seen a poll, those quest the way they word the questions makes a huge difference as to how the data shows up. And they're very tricky about it. They're looking for a certain answer. So they question you that way. That's why I don't trust polls. They haven't been right in the last uh, 10 years on any of the elections. So why would we go to that source to determine what's going to happen on November 5th if they're always wrong. I mean, it's like, <laughs> it's, it's like going to a, a tax person and you get audited every year. Why would you go back to that tax person? Yeah. I, I she said, you can't trust any polls. None of no, them. No, I just, agree. Cause they, cause they just don't, they don't just have the accurate data at all. Well, the good thing about Arlene too, and I've had her on the show before and she's a wonderful lady and she's very, very smart. And I've always told her, I said, I feel good about talking to you because you always have the data 
to back up the bullshit I spew. I'm I'm going I'm going on just what I know about facts and 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 psychology and all this kind of stuff, my gut feeling and just seeing what's going on and deciding what's going to happen next. She's very meticulous about data and information. She's very detail oriented and she's a good person to listen to because I think there's a lot of people out there that are terrified and they're looking for people like me or, or her or any number of other people to make them feel better. And, and that's a tragedy in this country that people have to be terrified at the prospects of what might happen in a fucking election. This should not be happening. Yeah. I, and I think that I, I almost think that it, if, if Texas turns blue, it's going to be a landslide. Oh yeah. Too. I, mean, I mean that, I think she's going to say, I think, She's way ahead farther than anybody thinks she is. I, do I think she. I don't know how she can't be. I mean, polls forget. Throw the polls out. Throw the emotional shit out. The difference, the discrepancy in fundraising is huge. It, it wouldn't suggest that we're close polls. Um, the crowd she pulls. She goes to Washington D.C. and pulls seventy-five thousand people. Donald Trump barely pulls. 10,000 people and he makes a fool out of himself. It's just, there, well, there, there's no of, logic. Didn't they bust a bunch of those people into New York city? I mean, those weren't just, they, they, yeah, yeah they were well, just people. They were just people off the street in New York. They brought them from all over the country in there. Donald Trump's campaign rallies are a lot of like the uh, grateful dead people who follow him around over and over to every other fucking ca uh, campaign, selling merch on the side to, to eat or clothe themselves. Uh, Donald Trump was on stage and he pointed out a group of women who were from North Carolina. And uh, he announced that they said this was their 249th campaign rally. Now, these are some cult fucking members. But if you've got people following you around the country, that doesn't that doesn't translate into more votes. And that's the point of doing these campaign rallies, get more votes, but he does everything in his possible power to get less votes. Yeah. And he, every time he opens his fucking mouth, he says something more stupid yeah. or gets on or gets on X and or whatever and says stupid shit and calls, you know, she's still the sitting vice president of the United States of January 20th, no matter what. You, you, know you know what I mean? And, yeah. And and she deserves she deserves the fucking respect just because of the fucking office. And you call her every fucking name in the book, you dirty son of a bitch. And 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 then and then when Joe Biden says uh that his followers are garbage, oh my God, you're a bully. You hurt my sensibilities. You know, and th th this is the epitome of bullies and cowards. They get in your face, they threaten you. Moment you push back, they say, oh, you're crazy. Why are you so violent? I get it all the time because people come up to me thinking I'm just a quiet Democrat, but I end up talking like they do, but I don't think like they do. And when you push them back, they immediately get defensive and they start suggesting that you're the crazy one, that you're the violent one. Well, fuck you. I don't care if they think that. Somebody needs to push these bastards back. And now we're doing it. Well, the other, the, it's a fascist rally or whatever it was, Nazi rally that he had in Madison Square Garden. It's the comedian that they, you know. Tony Hinchcliffe. That, yeah. yeah, that said all the bullshit. And then they had to draw the line with a joke with the C word. Yeah. Really? Really? Yeah. That's where you're going to draw the fucking line? You called her a moron. You called her, and Tucker Carlson called her all kinds of fucking names. You know, yeah. who the fuck is he? Who the fuck is he? He got fired from Fox fucking news. That's <laughs> now that's that's lower than whale shit. I'm telling you that right now. Yeah, that's that's that, that's absolutely right. I will say this about Donald Trump. Something I appreciate about appreciate Donald Trump for. He makes me look like a genius because I, <laughs> because I've always said, you know, people say he's going to do this speech. He's going to say this. He's going to say this. And I always say. Let that motherfucker talk, because every time he talks, he burns himself down. Everything he says works better against him than anything Kamala Harris can say. And what happens? Oh, the Haitians are eating pets. <laughs> or or Puerto Ricans are a bunch of garbage in the middle of the ocean. Kamala couldn't have done a better job burning him down than he did to himself. 
Well, then, then the next day he doubles down again. He can't say I'm, he's such a narcissist. He can't say I'm sorry or I'm wrong or I shouldn't have done that. You know, yeah. I mean, he can't apologize to anybody. He just doubles down and says, well, fuck yeah, this all happened. Yeah, that's you know? that's that's the thing about him. That's the uh, the symptoms of being a narcissist. They can never say they're wrong, and they can never accept that they've lost. And that's been obviously apparent with Donald Trump. Now, when Tony Hinchcliffe went out there and said this about Puerto Rico and some other things, uh, the smart thing would be to do. Any crisis manager would say, look, I didn't know he was doing it. I'm sorry. I don't stand with him on this. That would be the smart thing to do. But Donald Trump is just incapable of doing that. He can't, in his mind, he cannot say I was wrong. Besides the fact that, as you pointed out, we know what Tony Hinchcliffe was going to say was vetted and edited. So they did agree. The campaign did agree to put that part in there about the Puerto Rican garbage. So they can't win for losing. They look stupid every time. They try to come out strong but they always lose. Do you really think they vetted everybody that was up there going to speak that day? Because there was some, there was some bullshit spewed that day. Oh yeah. It wasn't I, just Tony. I mean, I mean, Oh, I, you know, Rudy Giuliani up there, that little sawed off little prick. He, why the hell was he up there? He should have he ought to be living on the street. Wasn't he supposed to sell all his bullshit to pay those ladies in Georgia? He still owes. I think they're about in the process of doing that. And uh, I was going to say, you said sawed off little prick. I would add sawed off broke ass bitch little prick because they're going to take everything he's got. There's there's just no question about it. He had seven days uh, from about a week ago. So I have to believe they're going to start selling shit off any minute now. And he fucking deserves it. You know, and then we hear about Mike Lindell. He had to get some emergency loan for some crazy amount of interest. And now he says he's not paying it. I mean, here's a guy who had a thriving business, a lot of people working for him. And I feel sorry for those folks because this place is probably 10 miles from my place. And uh, there's going to be a lot of people that are just trying to do their job and their boss will have destroyed their futures because he's a dumbass. Um, there's going to be a lot of people paying prices and penance after November 5th. <laughs> and it's going to be fun to watch. Yeah, the, and these people that are just disrespecting her, like even that Brett Baer in the interview, you know, I mean, how can how can he disrespect her like that? She, like I say, she's the fucking sitting vice president of the United States, and you talk to her like that? You motherfucker. Well, it's not surprising that he did the same thing to Joe Biden as sitting president while he was the candidate against Donald Trump. It's, it's just unimaginable what they do. But, but look how it turns out. Brett Baer is disrespectful to Kamala Harris. In the end, Kamala Harris looked good. Brett Baer was backstepping, two-stepping, and trying to talk his way out of an embarrassing situation. And his career is going to be affected by this dumbass mistake and what he did when he was talking to Kamala. How, do, how does And how does Fox News, a, a news organization, supposedly— or for entertainment or whatever, able to spew all the bullshit they do all the time and have all these followers listening to them like, like they're Jesus Christ himself. Well, there's two reasons for that. You didn't, you weren't able to do that back in the day when you and I were young. That's because there was a, a law called the fairness doctrine where you had to give equal time. You had to be truthful. You had to do all those sorts of things. But of course, Ronald Reagan from our past um, decided to get rid of that. So now they can do whatever they want. They can run rogue, whatever they want. And then the second thing is the most disconcerting thing I learned since Donald Trump became president is that this is the most disconcerting thing. I was not aware that there was such a large faction of stupid fucking people, but this country has a huge number and when I say huge, I'm talking 25, 30 percent. But that is a huge number of stupid people in a country that should be pretty well educated. Yeah. And yeah. And you even see you even see college educated people around here where I live. Farmers that have multimillion dollar farms that are True. Trump, 
you have daughters and granddaughters running around the yard, you know what I mean? Great granddaughters, and they're going to vote Trump every time, you know? They don't care if they have an abortion ban. They don't care about their about their granddaughters or their daughters or anyone else or their nieces or great nieces. If you have a woman in your life of any kind, you should be voting fucking blue up and down and getting rid of these fuckers. You know, I was talking um, yesterday to Tony and uh, I said, one of the reasons why I know Kamala is going to win is Kamala, in my mind, in my lifetime, is probably wanting the best, most successful presidential campaign I've ever seen. You know, I was born in 60. Up until this time, I've never seen a presidential ca campaign run as well as this. Conversely, I've never seen a worse presidential campaign than Donald Trump's. I mean, he keeps stepping on his dick every time he fucking turns around. So just those two things uh tell me that it shouldn't be a close margin when the election comes down. Uh, well, what are your thoughts about Kamala's campaign? Are you Can you concur with that? Tony at first said, well, I don't know if it's the best. And then toward the end, he said, yeah, it's probably the best. What do you think? You've been around a while. Yeah, I, I voted my first time for Ronald Reagan in 1980, just like just like you did. Yeah. My grandfather was a, was a Republican pre precinct committeeman until he died, you know, I mean, for 50 years, he was, you know, it was Republican. He would listen to Rush Limbaugh. I listened to all that bullshit until I finally pulled my head from my ass and decided I was going to think on my own and started and was working for a living and knew the Democrats were going to help me do that more than Republicans were going to try to tax me more or whatever it might be, you know. So I. Well, in, in, in 1980, when there was a lot going on, first of all, <clears throat> We don't have a Republican Party like we did back then. And I'm not suggesting that Republican Party was good, but the Republican Party, as we once knew it, doesn't exist. You were 18 at the time when you voted for Ronald Reagan. I was 20. And the problem we have, we can see it now, back in those years between the time we were 18 and 20, uh, we were coming out of time, uh, Jimmy Carter. The economy was kind of shitty. Gas prices, gas shortages, all this shit. But the most important thing why people like you and I voted for um, um, Ronald Reagan is because we had back then we had more testosterone than we had intellect. At least I know that was the case with me. And I'm guessing the same with you because. Of course. And, 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 and it was just the thing to do. We had Ronald Reagan did a lot of the same things Donald Trump did. The only difference between Ronald Reagan is. Ronald Reagan was smoother about it. He he understood kind of what he was doing, and he was a better communicator. And uh, but he lost his mind toward the end of his term too. Yeah, and I he probably ran one a pretty good campaign, but in eighty I can't remember back that far. But I you know against Jimmy Carter, there was it was probably going to beat him no matter what. But I I listened to some of her speeches, and I just it they are just moving yeah. emotionally moving and that's that's what gets everybody going and the you know and some and the ads that she's putting out that are just you know for the people for the for the middle class you know when and when have we had presidents have been for middle class you know and and try to do everything they could to increase you know our kids and grandkids life well and and the fact that she she wants to work for the middle class, assuming she actually does that. That's one of the pressures that Joe Biden had going against him. He wanted to work for the middle class. He was in an interesting situation. He wasn't going to be able to run again. He's older. He's going to be out of politics. He had nothing to lose. So Kamala did the smart thing and, and follow up with what he was talking about. But where the, where the pushback comes from is all these wealthy people that support Republicans, whether they think Donald Trump is crazy or not, they are terrified at the prospect of the middle class gaining some ground or gaining some benefit from the taxes we pay. They're like dogs that are greedy. They don't want a lot of money. They want all the money. And what Kamala presents is the opposite of that. And that is making them crazy at this point. Making them, making them pay a little bit more in taxes and helping out the middle class. What What's wrong with that? I mean, how much money do you actually need? You don't need it all. No. What do you, you know? 
I mean, really, you need you need enough to survive, you know. I mean, that's it. You don't need it all. No, you don't. And, you know, that's one of the lessons I've learned. You know, when I was young, I want to be rich, famous, have all the toys and all the stuff. And now at 64, I sit here and I'm comfortable. I'm not rich. I don't have every toy that I may want, but I'm comfortable. I do the things I want to do within reason. And um, that's where the true happiness comes. When you don't have the pressures of having to try to make a billion dollars or try to cover the cost of all these things, downsizing like my wife and I did and living the way we want to live and, and start worrying more about experiences than we are about things. There's a certain comfort to that. And, and greed isn't always necessary. It's not always good. Yeah. <clears throat> I, I feel the same way. That's we're comfortable. My, I, I got to retire. My wife's a little bit younger than I am. She's got to work for a little while longer, but she works from home. I, I spend my days doing stuff around the house and, and, I'm comfortable and I, and, and I feel like we're middle-class, you know, we got yeah. a nice home, we got a nice car, you know, I mean, what else do you need? You know, grandkids, everybody's healthy. All the kids are healthy. Grandkids are healthy right now. So, I mean, we're doing good. The only m extra money I need is to buy some kind of candy to have in my pocket. Every time I see my, my grandchild. I, last time I saw her, I pulled out one of her favorite candy things and she was trying to do something and dad was arguing with her. And I said, honey, if you just do it, I got this for you when, you, when you're done. Okay, grandpa. And he, she walks up to me and she says, grandpa, how come you always bring me candy or a treat? And I said, well, honey, that's kind of my job. I mean, that's... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's my job. I'm a grandpa. I, you know, I get you treats. I want to see you smile and all that stuff. And she looks at me and she says, grandpa, you're doing a good job. Keep it up. <laughs> yeah. so now, out of the mouths of babes. Out of the mouths of babes. And, uh, you know, if that's the most important thing I have to worry about in my personal life is making sure my granddaughter smiles. I'm a fucking happy man. I'm a happy man. Hey. Uh, yeah, I feel the same way. It's, it's so much fun to have the grandkids, but you know, they wear me out anymore. Oh, it's Jesus it's, Christ. Yeah. We we got a six month old granddaughter. Our youngest one is six months old. So we get her overnight once in a while. And I and I pretend like I don't hear her in the middle of the night. And I just lay in bed. And my wife takes care of and Heather takes care of everything. And I don't have to <laughs> don't have to mess with it. Well, that's that's the thing. You know, we go out and uh uh we hang out with a kid and spend a couple hours, maybe three hours with her. And you don't notice it at the time, but I'm going back in the car. I'm going, man, I'm fucking tired. And I still got to do a podcast for God's sake. So after getting worn out by this kid, I got to come here and talk about uh, the other shit that hopefully will make her life better when I'm dead and gone. Um, so, so you moved from Florida to central Illinois. That, well, where were you originally? That's where I was born and raised in central Illinois. I, I grew so up. So that's why you went back there. Yeah, and that's what this is where all my family is. My dad's still alive, and he's going to be eighty-three. And he's, and I'm glad we did because he's having some health problems. And we, I, me, I was homesick, and I was sick of the bullshit in Florida. Ron DeSantis is Ron DeShitstain is a piece, piece of work. I'm telling you, he's. So we ended up just coming back, but I was born and raised in a real small town of 350 people, a little bitty farming community. And my grandfathers were farmers and and uh, my uncles, my dad ran a local business and we we still own a little farm up there. So where in Florida did you live? We lived in Titusville and okay. it's it's like the, the Space Coast, right? Like halfway between uh, Cape Canaveral and uh, Daytona Beach. You know, when I was a little kid, well, maybe not little, maybe in my teens when it first opened, my family went down to Disney World. And we flew to Orlando and then went to Disney World. We had to drive away, obviously, and get down to Kissimmee or Kissimmee or whatever you call it. And I remember Orlando kind of being kind of a magical, fun place. Now, as of late, going in the winter months to Savannah, Georgia, there, are, there weren't flights directly to Savannah. So I'd have to fly into Orlando and drive up. I've been sorely disappointed in what I see in Orlando. It's not like I remember. It's hectic. It's dirty. And you got to be careful where you go in Orlando. And I, 
Do you concur with that, or am I just giving it a bad rap here? No, I I concur. Yeah, you can get in some bad places in Orlando. I'm and there's uh, and it's it's so spread out. It is huge anymore. You don't know when you're going into Orlando and when you're going out of Orlando. It just True. seems like you just keep driving through it forever and ever and ever. It's just it's so spread out. You know, I'm really hoping Florida does turn blue. Not so not, not even as much about the politics as it it's actually a beautiful state. We we go you know, we were at Key West last winter. Uh we go down to Fort Myers frequently. I just don't feel compelled to go to Florida with all the shit that's going on at this point. They need a better climate there. And I'm not talking about the weather, I'm talking about a political climate so people feel welcomed going back there. Because tourism is the lifeblood of Florida. And people are just worried about it. I mean, hell, there's a travel advisory for people of color to go down there. And that that should not be happening. Well, you know, this this shit stain, that's what we'll just call him from here on out. Um, he he took away the Reedy Creek from uh, right. Disney, you know, and then laid all that money on Orange County, which includes Orlando. So now they have to take care of all those roads, all the sewers, the fire, the police. I mean... They take care of everything now just because he was pissed off because they stood behind some gay and lesbian people, yeah. you know, you know, and it's just, it, it's unbelievable that he was able to do that kind of stuff. You know what I mean? And, and really screw the taxpayers of Orange County. Well, that's the point. He did something out of pride that was ill-advised. And then the people of, the people who are his constituents have to pay the price. I got to have, I, I got to believe the people in Orlando and in those areas that are now being taxed extra because of this prideful move, they got to be pissed about this. They can't, they can't just be unaware that this happened because Ron DeSantis is an asshole. Well, <clears throat> yeah. And Orlando and, and Orange County is a blue County. Most of the time it will, it will vote Democrat. But what do you got Rick Scott down there? And now Matt Gates, you know, who's heard from him since they talked about him messing around with some 17 year old girl and you haven't heard a word out of him. Uh, it's fucked up down there. The insurance is screwed up. They have a lot of problems and he's not doing anything to fix anything. But do you think people, is, people are feeling it enough to say, fuck Ron DeSantis, fuck Rick Scott, fuck Matt Gates? Are they... The, I've always said you need to get pinched in the ass with some people before they act. Are they getting pinched in the ass now? Well, I think they I think they are, because before when we lived down there, people had signs that said in their yards, like like political campaign signs that said, thank you, uh, Ron, for keeping Florida free. And you don't see any of that shit down there anymore. Wow. You know, I mean, you don't you don't see the like I say, you don't see the the MAGA bullshit down there like like he used to at all. I mean, not, uh, uh, there would be guys with Trump flags and their trucks, you know, on the back with a Confederate flag all over the place down there. And you just don't see it anymore. Well, that's good to hear. Hopefully it does turn blue and hopefully they can kind of recover and uh, make it uh, the kind of a paradise that it once was. Just a reminder, I'm talking to Cress, who is a listener and, uh, uh, is in central Illinois. And Cress, when we were talking be, before the show started or be, before we took a break, um, you mentioned that you've, you know, you've done farming and you've lived in Florida, but you also kind of have a history of politics, you, you, working in politics. Maybe you can explain to folks some of the stuff that you were doing. Well, we worked, um, I worked with uh, Rod Begoyevich. He was running for for governor here that ended up going to prison for trying to sell Barack Obama's uh, Senate seat. I started out there doing that and started in with uh, Springfield, not too far away, our, our capital. So we got into some mayoral uh, campaigns and a friend of mine, we helped get, we uh, knocked on doors and put up signs and did all that, you know, did all the fundraising, everything for a couple of times. And then we ended up moving to Florida and while we were in Florida, he lost his third chance at mayor, mayor in Springfield. But, um, yeah, I've been for about 20 years. I, I retired from the municipal, the city of Springfield. They own their own electric water and electric uh, 
So I worked for them for almost 20 years and that's where I retired from. So, and everything in Springfield that you do is, is political. I mean, even there's a couple of big major hospitals there too. And that's all trying to get a job. There is all political too. You, you know, you got to know somebody to do something, you know, or get somewhere. Well, um, what got you into being politically motivated? I have to be honest. I do this TikTok. I've never really been all that politically motivated. I was on a park board for a while. I was on a planning commission for a while. And I got really kind of annoyed by the bureaucracy and how it was all kind of bullshit. You know, they put you, it was kind of a, it was kind of a thing. They put you on this board to just go through the process, but you still had to do what the the main guy in the organization told you to do. What got you involved in, in, in campaigning and in politics? Well, when, as, as far as Robbie Goy was, was concerned, he was a Democrat. He was running for, you know, he was a Democrat running. So we were, we were behind the Democrat with our union for sure. And then uh, fast forward to when we we were working with, uh, his his name was Jim Langfelder, was the mayor here at two terms. He was a friend of mine, him and his brother is the uh, county recorder. And he's running for reelection now too. Um, and I have one of his signs in my front yard. His name's Josh Langfelder. But they were friends of, our, friends of ours and we just, you know, that's what they that's what we do around here. When a friend needs help, we just go out and help. And we knocked on doors and and, you know, and people talk about, you know, this person was an asshole or this person was, you know what? you We knocked on a lot of doors. I had a handful of people that ever threw anything back in my face or was unwelcome to what we did or anything. They were everybody was very courteous in everything we ever did. And I just I just enjoyed helping them. You know, I mean, it was kind of fun. You get out, you meet a lot of new people, you, you know. I mean, it's a little bit of time a week, but, you know, it doesn't. A lot of people try to make the comparison of the Obama campaign to the Kamala Harris campaign. And it's interesting because, of course, Obama came out of Illinois, Chicago area, Illinois. Um, what what would how would you compare what was going on back in two thousand eight when he was running? Because there was a lot of excitement about it, obviously, as compared to what we're seeing now with Kamala. Would you make them comparable or? Oh, I think it's I think it's a lot more exciting now. I Do you? it's just she. Oh well, you know he's a, he's a very good speaker. Don't get me wrong. He can get a, he can get people motivated, and he's one of the best I've ever heard. But every speech that I've heard her say here lately. It just keeps getting better and better and better from the one I I didn't hear the whole thing from last night at the eclipse. Is that the name of it? The ellipse. Yeah. What, the ellipse. Yeah. I, I didn't hear it all, but I heard like the last couple minutes of it and she's awesome. She is becoming an awesome speaker and yes, she, she is. and that's, what's helping her too. I mean, that people, pe people get moved, get emotional by listening to, things like that, that she's trying to really pull, you know, you got to put your heart and soul into this campaign. You know, you got to put in the vote, just get out and vote. That's all you have to do. You know, it's interesting when, when you've got a vice president running for the presidency, it's a tough position to put them in because they can't speak out contrary to the sitting president because they still work for that president. It's really a touchy area, but something happened. Uh, we were talking about it earlier, how, um, Joe Biden, who's got nothing to lose at this point, said that uh, the only garbage he saw <laughs> were the supporters of Donald Trump. And that got a lot of heat, a lot of kickback. And, and of course, he, he, he backed up on that a little bit. I don't have a problem with it because what he said was accurate. It may not be nice. It may not be sensitive, but it was accurate. They are fucking garbage. But when asked about it, when when Kamala was asked, do you, are you in line with what Joe Biden said about being the followers of Donald Trump being garbage? Now, if she'd been a Republican, she says, well, I didn't hear it and I don't want to talk about it. That's what they would have said. She didn't say that. She said, no, I don't agree with that at all, which was a big step uh, contradicting the sitting president, even though he backed off of it. And I appreciate her answering the question as opposed to diverting, distracting, and delaying whatever. She had the courage to just say, no, I don't believe that. And she kind of had to say that because you talked about her speech and how she said things that kind of gave you goosebumps. And the one thing she said is that she said, Donald Trump 
wants to put people who disagree with him in jail. I won't do that. The people who disagree with me, I will give them a seat at the table. That's exactly the right thing to say, especially for Republicans that don't like or can't stomach Donald Trump, but aren't sure they can vote for a Democrat. That was the exact right thing to say. Well, don't you think that politics, that's what politics is? Yeah. You you have two sides and you you compromise on something. I'm going to give you a little something. You're going to give me a little something. We're going to work this out and we're going to go on with our day. You know, and and that's what that's all she's saying. It's not just black and white. And Trump wants it all black and white. It's either you're with me and if you're not, you're going somewhere else. Well, you know, for decades and decades, the theory was that with Congress, the whole definition of Congress is uh, negotiation and compromise. But in the last 10 years, there's been zero compromise. Anything the Republicans want, the Democrats vote against, mostly because it's crazy. But anything the Democrats want to do, the Republicans vote against. So for all intents and purposes, our Congress is not functioning the way it's supposed to be. It's just not functioning. So for her to want to try to bring it back to that point and get along and be able to compromise and come up with good decisions as opposed to this obstructionist shit, you got to appreciate the attempt anyway. Whether she'll be able to accomplish it with these obstructionist Republican fucks, I don't know. But you got to try. Well, that's what I was going to say. Can you do that with Mike, with your Mike Johnsons and Marjorie Taylor Greene and Lauren Boebert and Matt Gates and these other Paul Gosar and all these other bullshit fuckers that don't know anything about compromise at all. It's either my way or the highway. Well, what do you know, a lot of people are suggesting, I've suggested that after this election, a lot of people walking on eggshells and worried about the election, that's all going to go away. There's going to be a lot of people that are vulnerable. We are under the impression that there may be some more superseding indictments uh, regarding January 6th. And some of those sitting members of Congress are more than likely to get some indictments because they were without question involved in that day and what happened that day. Hopefully, that's one way to kind of neutralize these fucks that want to destroy the process and destroy dem dem democracy. Hopefully, this is a way we can weed them out. Uh, yeah, I think uh, Jim Jordan's ass is in trouble. And she's... There's gonna there's some of those guys that are you're not hearing from right now. Jordan's one of them. Matt Gates is one of them. Marjorie Taylor Green, you're not hearing much out of her. Lauren Boebert moved from one district to the other because that's more Republican in that district. But she still will probably maybe even lose that. I don't know. But I think Marjorie Taylor Green's gonna get beat too. Isn't the guy a, a retired general or something that's yeah just absolutely. like kicking 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 her ass in the debates and everything else and the money and everything else. So. Well, and the thing uh, about it is, is what, you know, Marjorie Taylor Greene, I wasn't so sure she was ever going to get beat in that district because as much as I love Georgia, there are areas of Georgia that are just Republican shitholes. And I have to believe if they elected, um, if they elected Marjorie Taylor Greene twice, we got a bunch of stupid fucking people. Because even if you uh, like her uh, rhetoric, uh, if you like her rhetoric, the embarrassment that she gives to her district, you would think you'd want to get her out of there. Get, you, if you want somebody that's that that has all this crazy rhetoric, that's fine. But get somebody who's smart enough not to embarrass you. Did, did Dominion file a lawsuit against her yet for talking about sticking ba ballots in the machine as Republican and they're coming out Democrat at the other at the other end? That's about as fucking stupid as it comes. After Fox News had to pay almost a billion dollars and to them and you're going to fucking blow your they don't care they'll sue you they don't give a shit no uh, they, they've got nothing to lose they've got all the money in the world they can grind her into the ground but that just kind of shows how desperate they are i mean this is how people get when they get desperate they don't think about what they're doing they just grab at anything like donald trump is doing and say anything this is the time when a narcissist or whatever you want to call Marjorie Taylor Greene, this is when they get beat. This is the quick descent 
into the crash. And that's where Donald Trump is headed. That's where all these other people, MAGA in general, it's going to crash, it's going to burn, and it's going to die out. There'll still be some that stick around, but uh, they'll be few and far between when this is all done. Oh, yeah, I I truly believe that, too. I'm, I I haven't heard much about Bogart either. I don't know how she's doing that, but I guess there were some, some uh, several people on that uh, ballot that, that weren't good quality candidates either. Let's just put it that way. Isn't it funny, though, when you look at some of the people that are in Congress, you know, whether you're talking about Paul Gosar, Marjorie Taylor Greene, Matt Gates, or something like that, these people are members of the House of Representatives. And these are people, if we were bosses, we'd fire them. We certainly wouldn't be friends with them. We wouldn't let our kids near them. How does that happen? It's it's fucking amazing to me that people can be sucked into whatever these clowns say, and they will put them in a position of power. Well, and there's and there's there's certain, like you say, there's certain parts of this country that have such a massive amount of MAGAs or Republicans or whatever you want to say that that would not vote for a libtard for nothing. You know, I mean, they they'll vote they'd vote for the devil himself, and well, they pretty much are Donald Trump. But I mean, but but you know what I mean? They they don't give a shit what kind of character he has. You know, I mean, they don't give a shit what he says. He's a Republican, and he's going to change this country. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, you know, before we went on, you were talking about it. And you seem pretty confident about what's going to happen, but you still have a, a little concern and a little worry, you were saying. And that's natural, given the stakes here. Uh, but are you more confident than you are worried? You're, I, th- I think people are just anxious. For me, it's just I'm anxious. I want to get this fucking thing done and moving on to doing some positive things. Well, well, yeah, I think it's I don't think it's worry, worry near as much as it is anxious. I'm ready for a week from today, you know, and Joe Biden can break out of that fucking shell he's sitting around in and he can just for the I'm the president until the 20th of January. You fuckers are going to do what I say now. Yeah, you know, I hope he, like, I hope he I'd does. Be like, that. I'd be like Merrick Garland. I want your fucking resignation on my desk. The day after she gets elected president, we find out by fucking noon, you motherfucker. And I'm going to move Jack Smith or somebody in that temporary. And we're going to kick some ass for, between now and fucking January 20th. Yeah, That's I think what I would do. And I the think, first fucking thing I would do was was would be pardon my fucking son, too. I agree. They definitely have to. He has to pardon them just to spit in these fuckers eyes. Uh, yeah. some, What's some, he got to lose? No, you got nothing to lose. Uh, and the thing about it is, is some people have said, You know, once the election's over, he can do pretty much whatever he wants. But the real period of time where I'll have some power is between January 3rd and January 20th, because that's when the new uh, Congress will be seated. So presumably we'll have the Democrats controlling the House. And I really believe that they'll hold on to the Senate, too. And if Joe Biden's got 17 days with a majority in the house and the senate i say make some fucking hay while the sun shines and then kamala doesn't have to take any heat for it at all yeah I, that'd be a great time to go after the supreme court yeah yeah what, i mean you know what let's get some let's let's get some let's find out what what's really happening here you know i mean clarence thomas is taking money we know we all fucking know that you know i Billionaires are sending him on big lavish vacations, so he'll kind of sway in their way or whatever yeah. it might be. You know, I mean, there's there's some bullshit going on there. It's it's dirty from all the way up. It is. It is. Um, one of the things we've talked about is you want to do something with uh, codifying Roe v. Wade. You want to do something with the Supreme Court. But I think there's one step that you have to take before you get to those. And that is getting rid of the filibuster, or at least gutting the filibuster, or at least bringing the filibuster back to what it was when it was originally implemented. How do you feel about that? Uh, that's one thing I really don't know a whole lot about. I just, I, you know, I've listened to you talk about it somewhat, but I really don't, I really haven't, I really don't understand a lot of it. Well, the filibuster is this, basically. Um, it started out where 
that gave the minority a chance to deal with some things. And 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 originally the filibuster would be you'd get up and you'd talk forever until people were tired of it, and then they'd come to some compromise because they have to keep doing this. Uh, well, then they they they, they did what. Congress always does. They streamlined it. They made it a rubber stamp. So it got to the point where where they just rubber stamp say we're filibustering. And then the then what they have to do in in order to pass a bill, instead of a simple majority, which would be one vote, 51 votes in the Senate, now you have to have 60 votes, which is virtually impossible to get if you've got an evenly split Senate. So that means nothing gets done. That's why we have problems with getting bills passed. Uh, so they, they've carved up the filibuster uh, financial stuff. They can't use the filibuster. But during during the reign of Mitch McConnell and MAGA, they've weaponized the filibuster. It's become a perverted or polluted version of what the filibuster originally was. So they've got to either do something to peel it back or just get rid of it if we want to codify Roe v. Wade because um, if you want to codify Roe v. Wade, you're going to need 60, 60 votes in the Senate. And unless we get 60 Democrats seated on November 5th, it's not going to happen. Do you think, are we even going to get close to 60? No, I don't, I don't think, I don't think we will. Uh, I'm not sure. I think we'll keep the majority in the Senate. And I think that will be important, but 60 is a lot. Think, 60 is a lot. Do you think a you think there's enough Republicans after this ass beating that Trump's going to get will kind of maybe sway to the other side so they can get rid of the filibuster just to say, well, I'm trying to do everything I can or whatever, you know, and try. Well, you know, everything any politician ever does, they're always thinking about the next fucking election. They're not thinking about right. whether it's going to help you or I or anybody else. They're thinking about, well, now, will this get me reelected? Well, exactly. And what you have to understand about the filibuster, it's not just a Republican thing. When Republicans are in the minority, they love the filibuster. But when the Democrats are in the minority, they love the filibuster because it helps them shut down the majority. And what the biggest fear is that if somebody, if the filibuster isn't there and Republicans get in the majority of the Senate, they just start pushing th to through. And that's a that's a reasonable concern. Same would be for the Republicans regarding the Democrats. But my thought is, is I'd rather get shit done, whether it was right or wrong or in my mindset or in somebody else's mindset, than getting nothing done. And that's what the filibuster does. It stops us from doing anything. And people will say, what if the Republicans can't get in uh, uh, and they run a bunch of stuff through? Well, that should be motivation enough not to vote the motherfuckers in, be involved and stop them from getting in. Because when the Democrats get it, that's the same concern the Republicans have. They're just going to run stuff through. But the important thing, the reason there is a Congress is to get things done, not to not get things done. And that's what the filibuster does to fuck us up. Well, for two years, the Congress hasn't, uh, the House of Representatives hasn't done any fucking thing to do anything about no. starting, no. passing anything at all. You know, I mean, so, somewhere somebody's going to have to start doing some fucking thing. Well, you know, it, what was that? What was that line in uh, that Mel Brooks movie? Uh, Gentlemen, we got to protect our phony baloney jobs. Remember that on? Uh, yeah, uh, I'm trying to. You know, and it's just the politicians, they just they've got to they've got to do something. Well, and, 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 and uh, what was interesting about the House of Representatives, they didn't get anything done, although some people will say, well, they got the uh, the budget thing done and they got the infrastructure thing done. But the Republicans got nothing done. Anything that got done had to do, be done with the help of the Democrats. So the Republicans really accomplished nothing. Um and this is this is going to be a problem for them in this election. You've got two years of absolutely nothing uh, working. Um, the, the, the most devastating thing about the Republican Party is they're divided. As long as they're divided, they're weak. And that's why they can't get anything done. You got MAGA demanding on crazy shit. You got people that are thought to be reasonably minded, and they can't get anything done because they can't get a big enough majority. Uh, the Republicans have a mess that they need to fix up, and that's why I think when this is all done on November 5th, you might as well just burn the Republican Party down and start the fuck over.
You don't think Liz Cheney's going to try to revive the Republican Party, Matt Kinzinger, and some of the guys, some of the people that are kind of maybe the moderate Republicans? I guess, well, I don't know whether you no, call them moderate Republicans. No, not, I wouldn't, but, I wouldn't well, call Liz Cheney more, moderate. Well, maybe maybe more progressive Republicans. I don't know how you would, I don't know how you would, Madam Kinzinger would probably be more like that than, than she would, but 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 at least she has the integrity to do the fucking right thing when it needs to be done. But I understand where you're coming from with her too. Well, the thing with Liz Cheney is, is, is she's not moderate. She's, she's a very right leaning person. And yes, she does have integrity and she is concerned about the country. And she, uh, she is all about the truth and people will, put her on a pedestal. Democrats will put her on a pedestal because she has integrity. She stood with the truth and she stood against Donald Trump. My point of it is if you've got somebody in the house of representatives, isn't that the bare minimum we should expect out of them? Just because everybody else were fucking criminal and corrupt doesn't make her special because she did the right thing. Uh, no Democrat should ever want to vote for her because she she will vote against or vote for things that Democrats don't like. She's pro life or pro life. So the abortion issue is she's not going to help the matter much. And I said when she got she got voted out, I said, don't worry about Liz Cheney. She's going to stand back, and when it all burns down, she's going to hope against hope that she will be the one to lead the way to rebuild the Republican Party. I agree with you there. The only problem with that is, is we got this big influx of young people in 2024 and even bigger in 2028. These motherfuckers don't like hard right conservatives. So she's not the right one to lead a party. They've got to make a dramatic change and go to the more moderate. And she's just not moderate. So you're talking more like is Adam Kinzinger? I don't really know too much about him. I don't. I don't I either. Know from them, and I don't know. I don't know where he's where he's standing at. But they have to get rid of the. They have to get rid of the people like Mike Johnson and Mar Marjorie Taylor Greene and those people that are pushing and pulling the Republican the party down. Plus the the House of Representatives on the Republican side. You know they have to. We have to compromise. We have to work together to get things done. I well, mean this. This bullshit. I'm not going to vote with you because you're a Democrat. You're a libtard. You know, I'm just so fucking sick of hearing that shit all the time. Yeah, it's contrary to how it should be. And, you know, I, and I'm afraid even when Donald Trump goes down in a heap, MAGA will still be bumbling, bubbling under the surface. They'll be uh, sticking around like a uh, STD virus down in the villages. It's going to take a little little work to get rid of it. Um, so they're going to be bubbling up. So I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if the Republican Party splits off into two different parties, which is fine with me because then they're both weak. But um, they'd almost have to. There's so much difference in what people believe. And those people that see what happened to the Republican Party in this election are going to realize oh, we can't stand with these fucks anymore. They should have learned this before now, but they didn't. Uh, but they're going to learn it hard lesson on November 5th. Yeah, I oh I think they're gonna yeah there's gonna be a, there's gonna be a big change change coming there's a, there's definitely gonna be a blue wave I I truly believe that I think I think she's gonna win hands down I just depends on what states may turn blue it could be a, it could be a a big win a big win and if she wins if we, she wins the, uh, convincingly they don't have any reason to say that the Democrats stole the election. Oh, they I still mean, will. They, they will, still will. They will. But, but, you know, I mean, they're, he's he's rallying the truth, troops for violence, I think. And that and, you know, I mean, will there be any violence, you know, I mean, after the election? Uh, you know, you're going to have these pockets of these fucking crazy bastards out there that, you know, do anything he wants them to fucking do. You might see small groups or individuals cause problems. But there's not going to be the kind of violence we saw on January 6, 2021. Just knowing the psychology of, of, of bullies and and uh, Trump lefucks, uh, the advantage they had on January 6 is that Donald Trump was in the uh, Oval Office and he was holding back the, uh, the National Guard. I'm willing to bet on January 6, the National Guard's going to be standing on the fucking steps of the Capitol. 
I'm yeah, I'm guessing that too. I'm I mean they're probably got some kind of plan. I'm sure they do. I mean they they probably you know they probably been working on the plan for a long time. Yeah, I, yeah, you know, Joe Biden is not going to want to leave office with that stain on his record. And Joe Biden's yeah. uh, a tough enough. He seems like an easygoing guy, but he's a tough, decisive guy. And I think that coupled with whatever Kamala Harris will do, they're going to be ready to shut something like that down as quick as possible. But I, I just don't think they're going to rise up because they're not the kind of people that walk into something unless they feel confident they're going to win. And, um, you know, we, we've seen it when he was, Donald Trump was indicted. Oh boy, they're going to get mad civil war or when he gets convicted. Oh my God, there's going to be a civil war. Didn't see Jack shit. They're weak ass, pussy ass bitches and they ain't coming out. Chicken shit. Motherfuckers is what they are. They are, you know, they're, they're, they're mouse writing checks. Their ass can't cash. Exactly. And and keep in mind, since 2020, uh, we've got um, we've got a, a million people who died of covid. Uh, many of them would be people that were unvaccinated, meaning Republicans. Uh, we've got five thousand boomers dying a fucking day. Um, and then you've got at least a thousand of the violent motherfuckers from January 6th already in jail. So they're not in the strongest situation. Well, they that those guys fuck around and found out that they, they sure the hell did. They sure the hell did. It's going to get worse, and that's with Donald Trump in charge. So, so what's happened with the ballot boxes burning? I mean, is that I haven't heard much about that. Is that, have they figured out who did that? I know they had a, maybe a car or something they had on video that they thought was involved in it. But I mean, are we talking? Are these Republicans burning Democrat ballots, or what they think are Democrat ballots, or what? What is going on? Well, I suppose the presumption is that's what's happened, but there's no way that ballot box is all Democrats. It's got to be Republicans in there, too. It's just some dumbass trying to, you know, make a name or, or try to impress Donald Trump or something. I mean, a lot of the in at least one of the boxes, I know they made an announcement said, if you put a vote in the ballot box between this time period, we need you to come back out and redo the ballots. I mean, we're not talking about millions of ballots here. We're talking maybe hundreds of ballots. It's really not going to affect anything ultimately, but people should have a right to to uh, to 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 have their vote counted. So they will try to do something with it. You know, it's just with Trump fucks these days, they're like they're like cockroaches. They're an annoyance, but they don't really have the power to do much of anything. Well, I just you know, I just assume that's what it was. I assume that's what it was because what they don't realize they're burning Republican ballots too. They think this is full. Of, you know, this is a this is a Democratic state. These are these are all Democrat ballots because they're the ones that vote early or vote by mail or vote whatever. You know, Americans go to the polls and vote on on election day. You know what I mean? So I'm sure they had some kind of fucking excuse why they did it. Well, there was a um, hold on a second. See if I can find it. Um, the Supreme Court yesterday made a decision, another fucked up position, said an alarming Supreme Court decision green lights Virginia voter purge. At least 1,600 people could be removed from the rolls, even though lower courts said the governor's effort was not legal. The Supreme Court has agreed to temporarily pause a lower court's order that reinstated 1,600 votes to the rolls in Virginia, even though an appeals court found the purge court of voters occurred in a violation of quiet period, barring systematic changes to the roles so close to the election day. So they haven't really made a decision on it, but uh, but they put a pause on purging uh, the, the, the decision to not purge these 1,600 votes. Um, but here's the deal. Are the Democrats going to win Virginia anyway? Probably not. No. Uh, the Supreme Court just burned their ass again. This is going to be another thing that's going to come back to haunt them. Uh, but they say, we're going to put a pause on purging these things, allowing them to purge these things. Well, no fucking rush. We're just five days away from the election. Uh, you Supreme Court, what were you, were you on a fucking fancy trip with some billionaire? Get, give us a decision. Well, don't well, tell us you don't have time yet. Well, you know, I mean, 
this is the fastest decision they've ever made. You know, I mean, partial decision they've ever made. <laughs> they've yeah, fucking absolutely. ever made. You, you know, why don't well, you just hold off and just not say anything about it until after the election and see what happens and see if you could suck up the election. It's not the fastest one they've ever made. Remember when they were talking about the immunity thing, they took forever given down. Oh, yeah. You know where the fast one was when it came to Roe v. Wade, they made that quick, oh, fast yeah. and in a hurry. <laughs> yeah. Well that, yeah, I think Jenny Thomas was behind that shit too. I think she leaked it early anyway. Yeah. I, I've always thought that. Well, you, you, you know, were, there's a, there's a problem, there's a problem with her too. You know what I mean? There's, it's not only, it's not only Clarence, it's her too. She's and a that, fucking MAGA, MAGA, super MAGA. Well, and that's why I've said, you know, and, and the way I look at it is probably a little less tactful than, or even legal, maybe. I don't know. But I think the first thing that should be done uh, right after Kamala is elected and inaugurated, somebody from the DOJ uh, needs to go to Clarence and say, look, Clarence, you and your wife are definitely getting indictments. Now, we don't want to put you through all this shit and expose who you are and fuck up your legacy. How about this? You just fucking retire, get the fuck out of Dodge, and then you can live your life in obscurity. Um, I know a lot of people would like to see him punished, and I would too, but I'd more like to see him the fuck out of there. Well, yeah, me too. And I thought about that the day after the election. That'd be something Joe Biden could do too. You get Clarence Thomas's ass in my office the next morning, nine o'clock in the morning. I got to talk to that motherfucker, you know, and and bring Alito with him. You know, <laughs> we're gonna get we're gonna get a twofer today. And bring and by the way, just to have Merrick Garland come in too, I need to fucking talk to him too. Just yeah. all three of them, nine o'clock in the morning, you know. And let's start a real investigation into Brett Kavanaugh. Find out what he really yeah. did as yeah. opposed to the bullshit yeah, they pulled. Let's stick the fucking FBI on him. And another thing I wanted to ask about, too, has anybody heard about what the FBI's investigation about the two assassination, quote unquote, assassination attempts on, no. on Trump? You know, I mean, I thought maybe that might be the October surprise. I thought that I thought that might be, you know, they always talk about that. But I think and I've heard and maybe it's Rachel Maddow or somebody said they thought that the the fascist Nazi rally was the October surprise for Kamala Harris after everybody watched that fucking thing. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, that was devastating to Donald Trump uh, as far as how he was portrayed and how that whole event was portrayed. That didn't help Donald Trump in the least. And that's always been my argument. Everybody says, well, he could win in 2024. Remember, he lost in 2020 by 7 million votes and a number of electoral votes. My question to anybody that says Donald Trump can win in 2024 is please tell me how he gained votes since 2020. Because I can't think of one thing. The convictions, yeah. 34 convictions, that didn't help him. Being found liable of sexual assault or rape, that's not didn't help him. These these campaign rallies, these unhinged rallies, he didn't gain votes there. So if he didn't win in 2020 and he found no way to gain at least the seven million votes that he lost by, how can he even how can anybody even think he has a chance to win? When they're they're predicting 150 million people are going to vote this time. I think you it's know, I mean, somewhere somewhere in, you know here or there around 150 million people are going to vote. Well, I think it's going to be more than that, because if you look at 2020, Joe Biden got 81 million, Donald Trump got 74 million. That was 155 million people who voted, which was unprecedented. It was the biggest turnout. I think we're going to have a bigger turnout. And I think it's because I think in 2020, we had a big turnout because people hated Donald Trump and because they were terrified of him getting back in office. And there has been nothing that happened since 2020 to make people feel better about that. It's only made them feel worse. So I'm I'm thinking we might even have a bigger turnout than that. Well, we can only hope. And and you know, and these and these Republicans that say, well, I just can't trust her. And I just don't know about Donald Trump. And I'm I'm just not going to vote. I'm like, fine, don't fucking vote. Stay the fuck home because if you're going to vote for Donald Trump, stay the fuck home. And I think we might see some people, a lot of people actually, that that just can't stomach voting for Donald Trump, but also can't stomach voting Democrat because they 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 can only vote where there's an R. 
And um, I hope hopefully that's the case because I don't care if they fucking vote. If they don't want to vote, that's fine. Uh, the big question, I think Kamala wins without a problem. Uh, the big question is the down ballot. Is that something you worry about at all? I mean, when we talk about Florida, if they're going to vote against Donald Trump, if that happens and it turns blue, I can't possibly believe that they wouldn't vote for Donald Trump, but they'd still vote for Rick Scott. That just makes no sense. Well, that's that's the biggest thing that I thought would turn would make the state turn blue is because of Rick Scott. You know, he's been exposed at all his, you know, crimes and and uh, where he ripped off the health care, the Social Security Administration or whatever. He was overcharging Medicare or whatever it was, you know, and there and then he's talking about, you know, uh, Social Security and Medicare are entitlement programs and we need to get rid of them and that gal's got a pretty good and she's getting some money from the DNC too she's she I think she she's gonna win and I think all in call Colin Allred's gonna win in Texas and I think Josh Hawley's ass is on 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 the block chopping block too because um that abortion issue in Missouri I listened to a lot some iHeart radio during the day and for some reason, I pick up a Missouri station or whatever where I'm at, and they they run that abortion ad every half an hour on 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 uh, iHeart during the day. So I mean, and he was he's super MAGA too, chicken shit super MAGA. You saw what he did on January 6th, running like a little bitch down the hallway trying to find some place to hide. You know, I mean, he's just like the fucking rest of the chicken shit bastards. Yeah. Yeah, I think all that's going to come to light. Do you, I get the feeling that after the election, there's just going to be a watershed of evidence and possible indictments. People have just been standing on their tippy toes because they don't want to look political like Merrick Garland. But once this election is over, there's got nothing to hold them back. There are people that need to be accountable for the shit they did. And I have a feeling that... Uh, it's going to be a fucking rainstorm on a lot of these Republicans that may or may not be expecting it. I'm I'm ready to see some of that redacted information that Jack Smith got about all those fucking names instead of numbers or kind of they've kind of got it figured out who this might be or who that might be. You yeah. know, I want to see I want to see the fucking hard evidence. And I don't understand where Merrick Garland and and Joe Biden or somebody hasn't said, you know what? this is bullshit. Somebody's got to look into this. You know, this has been four years coming and you're still sitting on your fucking hands and it's not done yet. You know, I mean, and like you've said, I've heard you say before, you know, by not looking political, you are looking for love. Exactly. You know? Exactly. Well, you know, I, I really believe, and it irritates me that everything that hasn't happened up to this point is because people are terrified. Oh, we don't want to look political. And part of that I understand because whether they are worried about whether the public sees it as political and that's why they're holding back, I think part of the reason they're holding back too is they don't want to give anybody on the Republican side room to argue about it and put it in court. They aren't going to win in court, but they can delay it longer and longer and longer. So I think they're trying to be careful, uh, legally speaking, so they don't have an argument. Well, they just did it because of the election. Once the election's done, that's not an argument. Yeah, that, and I think Merrick, uh, Merrick Garland can't sit on his hands forever. I no. mean, we know she's going to, and we know she's going to, she's going to appoint a new AG, and I don't know who it might be. I know I've heard some, I've heard Liz Cheney's name kicked around a few times. I have, I I have think, heard I too. I I don't think that's going to happen. She might be in the cabinet somewhere. Adam King Greer. I think I think both of those are, you know, I don't I don't know who else it might be, but I'm sure she's got some idea. Well, I, you know, with Liz Cheney <laughs> putting her as as Attorney General, I don't know that I would normally do that because she is a Republican. However. She's got some, she got an ax to grind with the Republicans who caused her to lose her position. She is the spawn of the devil. So if you want a mean oh, motherfucker yes, going is. after these people, oh, yes. she may be the one to do it. Cause she's, she's like Kamala in the sense that uh, Kamala's a woman and, and she's friendly and, uh, uh, but she's a tough woman and Liz Cheney's not as friendly. And she, I have a feeling, well, we saw it. 
uh, in the January 6th stuff. She can be a rough woman. She's not fucking around. There's no playing around with Liz Cheney. Yeah, and I think, and I, you know, and that's that goes a lot for Kamala saying that she's going to put a some kind of Republican in somewhere in her cabinet to help. You know, she needs a little compromise there somewhere. Yeah, you know, I was just I was just looking it up. Uh, Ray LaHood was uh, was Obama's uh, transportation secretary his first. Well, from two thousand nine to two thousand and thirteen, right? And he was a he was a Republican representative from Peoria, from you know, from here in Illinois, and uh, he did that for four years. So I know I know that Democrats do that. Republicans don't usually put Democrats in there in any position in the cabinet. No, no, I you know one thing I think that's going to happen when Kamala is the president, as much as I like Joe Biden, and as much as I think he did a great job while he was in there. Joe Biden's too old school. He plays by rules that were established years back, decades back, and they just don't apply now. We're in a different world. We're in a different climate, politically speaking. And we need somebody that's more assertive and 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 tougher and willing to make people accountable. I think the tone of this country is going to be a, a little more righteous as opposed to political, once Kamala is uh, is in office, I think that's one difference we'll see between Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. Well, do you think that because she was a prosecutor before that that's her that's going to be her way of thinking and, I and do. picking somebody like Attorney General or whatever the cabinet position may be? You know, I'm I may need them to step it up and do this or that or the other. So I'm, I'm looking at this as a prosecutor as a you know, going in front of a jury is and a jury being all the American people, you know, and I've got to do things right. Well, and I think the best example uh, of it is in spite of it, the fact that it wasn't the best debate for Joe Biden. Look at the difference between the debate with Joe Biden and Donald Trump and Kamala and Donald Trump. Look at the difference in the campaigning between Joe Biden and Kamala. Kamala ain't fucking around. She's going after him. Joe Biden wouldn't normally do that stuff because it's just not polite to do in political company. That's the way it's been for years and years. There's been a lot of, you know, hands off of things. But Kamala knows she's in a fight with a dirty fucking fighter. So she's going to be strong and in people's faces that need to have her in their face. So I think we're we're going to feel like a stronger country once she becomes a like. Uh, and I'm not talking shit about Joe Biden. That's, you know, he's from a different era. Kamala's going to be from the new era, and uh, she's going to do the things she has to do. Well, yeah, that she's she's really got. I can't believe the support she got as fast as she got. I mean, it went from zero to a hundred in seconds. You know, as far as that goes, and she, it's just unbelievable support that she has right now. Well, and, and and you can thank Joe Biden for that. Joe Biden basically yeah. said, "Okay." I'm going to step aside, but we're going to do it my way. You're we're not going to, gonna, my, yeah. I mean, you can't look past after, Kamala, and then he endorses her, and, and then it explodes. Joe Biden is the mastermind yeah. behind Kamala Harris, and and he did it. He had a he. You got to give me a week, and he waited that week till after the Republican National Convention, and they nominated Donald Trump, and then he stepped aside. He had it perfectly fucking timed. He knew the way it was going to go. He had an idea of what was going to happen. And he knew the energy that she had. She's 20 years younger than he is. She's got a lot. I, You know, I'm 62. I can't do the shit I used to do when I was 42. I'm telling you that right now. You know, no. I, I can't imagine that 20 years from now when I'm 82, what I can, if I live that long, you know what I mean? I just, I, I, I don't. And she has had flying all over the country from one stop to the next and given a better speech every place she stops. I mean, it's just, yeah, it's unbelievable. Everything's working well for her. Um, I, uh, I can't do the things I did 30 years ago either. And thank God for that. I might be in fucking jail if I could. Uh, <laughs> if, my, wife if, calls, my wife calls that a retirement plan. Yeah. <laughs> oh shit. Uh, between <laughs> between getting older and my wife, I've been focused. <laughs> I'm better off in the yeah. long run. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, you know, the thing, the thing I will say about, we're going to wrap things up here in a second, but um, the thing I will say about Joe Biden, Joe Biden comes from a different era. He's an old school uh, politician, but it's my contention. And he showed it with what he did with Kamala Harris and setting her up to be the candidate. There is nobody in Washington, D.C. that's more experienced or more um, or smarter than Joe Biden. You might think he's slow. You might think he's old, but he's a smart motherfucker. And he's been able to get a lot accomplished because he's smart and he knows how to play the game. And that's the, that's the big difference between him and Donald Trump. Donald Trump didn't know how to play the game. He thought he'd make the game work to his in within his rules, and that doesn't work government, the United States, much bigger than Donald Trump. But Biden knows how it works. And he knows how Washington, D.C. works. Right. He knows how the whole political, the whole, you know, he's, he's spent his entire career in, in Washington, D.C. You know what I mean? So he's, and, he and knows that, how it works. And now we have a presidential candidate who will be president, who's had the benefit of being a prosecutor, an attorney general in California, a senator, and also work under the tutelage of the smartest guy in Washington, D.C. for four years. So she's well-trained and in a good position to be a hell of a president. Well, she can she can hit the ground running. She knows exactly what to do. She's, you know, I mean, that's just, she, she knows exactly what she's going to do. She has a plan. And she doesn't, she doesn't have, she has an advantage Joe Biden didn't have. Joe Biden had to come out of a pandemic and a crashed economy. Kamala's got no pandemic and a thriving economy, and she can focus on the other things instead of pulling us out of the depths. Yeah, the, and and the first thing's going to be is codifying Roe v. Wade. I think is going to be the first thing she's going to have to do. Yeah, we got we, we got to get some shit done, and I'm hoping the Democrats stay on their bicycle and keep pumping once they win this election and, and start to get shit done. And I think they will. And it'll be up to people like you and me to put the pressure on the Democrats when the Republicans are out of the fucking way. Well, my wife said today, she said, why do you want to do this? And I said, if I can get on, go on this show tonight and turn one person that's listening to this to vote for Kamala Harris, I've done exactly what I was supposed to do. Darling, it just takes one person. One more Abs person. Absolutely. And and the thing about it is, is, is people will say that to me. You think you're going to change things? I go, me personally? No. I just want to be the shit stirrer that gets people talking and thinking and telling other people who will tell other people. And that's how you start a groundswell of things. You know, when I first started doing TikToks or podcasts, I, you know, I didn't have that many followers or listeners. But you keep doing it and you're consistent about it and you're honest about it you build a bigger crowd. And as you build a bigger crowd, that's how people win elections. That's how people gain an audience. And that how, that's how you, you gain people talking about the right shit as opposed to the bullshit that the media is uh, spewing on us. Well, I just wanted to, I wanted to mention too, tonight we, uh, we had trick or treating tonight uh, where oh. I live. So, and, and it's getting, it's nice night and tomorrow it's supposed to be kind of crappy. So everybody's out tonight. But my wife was out giving candy. She had one lady. I have a Harris Walls sign in my yard. And they, she had one lady that said when she walked away, hey, I like your sign. And I'm like, that's all it takes. That's, you know, we probably had 100 kids tonight. We've had more kids tonight than we ever have had. We ran out of candy. And we had a lot of candy. <laughs> anyway, uh, uh, you know, that was, that was the highlight of the night for me. Is, is somebody mentioning something about my sign? Absolutely. Absolutely. And my wife has a t-shirt that old soul center and it, no old, no, we, I think we sent old, I, whatever. It's a t-shirt that says, uh, I'm voting for, uh, Gus Wall's dad. And she loves wearing it, you know? And I said, what are you going to do if somebody stops you? Some Trump the fuck. And, uh, <laughs> And she said, I'll just turn them over to you and you'll make them cry. And I go, there you go. Let's <laughs> fucking do that. Perfect. Go, go fuck yourself and go on. Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, uh, well, Cress, I appreciate you coming on. I told you it was going to be easy and it was going to be fine. And once again, I'm right a fucking again. <laughs> well, it was a, it was a pleasure. I, I was a little nervous at first. I feel a little better now and got some things off my chest. I, 
you know, like I said, I sit around here, I'm retired. I got a lot of shit to think about, you know, so a that's, lot of time to think about. Sid. That, that's the same for me. People say, how can you do all the TikToks and the podcast? I'm retired, motherfucker. I get up in the morning yeah. thinking about, this is my job. This is actually my yeah. job. So Yeah. Uh, so uh, I'm just glad, and, I, and I'm glad that you're there to kind of ease everybody's anxiety. I'm going to call it anxiety more than worry now, because it's just like, you know, I mean, in the back of everybody's mind is what if, you know, I mean, that's the way it always, I think that's the way everybody is. Maybe I'm, that's the way I am, but I, I truly believe that she's going to win and win big. Well, I think the anticipation, I think people are afraid of the unknown more than anything. I was just talking to my son who started a new job and he's very anxious and worried about doing everything right. I said, look, man, it's the unknown that's scaring you, but the unknown will be only unknown for so long. You know, we've got five days for the election and uh, you're going to end up feeling relieved when it's not as bad as you think. But I want you to remember this. Think of all the time you wasted with that anxiety when it was absolutely unnecessary. I mean, I think I can say the same for you is the same for me. We're in our 60s. We've all gone through some trials and tribulations, tragedies, disasters, points in our life where we thought, oh, we'll never make it through this. Yet here, two old fucks sit here doing just fine. Somehow we saw our way through every possible tumultuous thing. And that's how it works. You worry about the unknown. You get there and you think, oh, God, I'm glad it didn't happen. But if you can train yourself not to worry so much about stuff and just look at facts and get rid of the emotion. And uh, I mean, I'm, I'm putting myself in a hell of a position here. I'm pretty confident about what's going to happen with Kamala Harris. I think she's going to win at very least decisively. People say, what are you going to do if you're wrong? Fuck, I've been married 40 years. I'm wrong every goddamn day, according to my <laughs> yeah. wife. It ain't <laughs> yeah, nothing new for me. Every fucking day. Yeah, yeah, Are me we... too. I'm I'm in the same boat with you. I've been married that long. Well, I've been married three times, maybe 40 years all three times. There you together, go. But... There you go. I got uh... <laughs> But 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 the point the point is 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 that there's no shame in being wrong. You can be wrong. I mean, in life, you're always wrong. And and I I, I tell my kids, I said, you're better off making the wrong decision than making no decision. Because when you're making no decision, you ain't moving forward. If you make the wrong decision, you can go, oh, I fucked up. Now what's next? How are we going to deal with that? And that's that's how you got to look at this. I know I'm not wrong about Kamala Harris. I know she's going to win. I'm hoping it's decisive. So I'm not really worried about it. The facts tell me that that's the way it's going to be. Just like the facts told me there would be no red wave in 2022. Everybody thought there was. I didn't because they just overturned Roe v. Wade. How do you win an election when you overturn Roe v. Wade? It just doesn't work. So it's okay to be concerned or anticipatory or anxious a little bit, but I'm dying for November 6th when it's apparent what's going to happen and everybody can fucking relax. Well, and I think we're going to know more. No, I think it's going to be such uh, decisive that we're going to know more on November 5th and we'd have to worry about November 6th. I think we're going to all know before we go to bed. And I will tell you, as somebody who watches me on TikTok, I need to give you a heads up. I've, I've made this threat before and, and I think I will probably do it. If she wins decisively on November 5th, on November 6th, I'm going to post a ton of TikToks. And I'm going to, I don't normally tag people in my TikToks, but I'm going to tag every Republican, Charlie Kirk, fucking Donald Trump, every one of them. I'm going to tag every one of them. And I'm just going to giggle my ass off. That's all I'm going to do on the TikTok. <laughs> I'm just going to laugh. <laughs> That'd be good. That That's excellent. That's that's exactly what you should do. And then go, fuck you, motherfucker, in the end. <laughs> yeah, Yeah, there, there's a pretty good chance I'll probably say that, too. Um <laughs> Well, Crest, thanks for coming on. I appreciate it. And uh, you're welcome anytime. Just now you know how it works. You send me an email, said, can you get me on? And when I got time, I'm getting a lot more more guests now. I got one for every day of the week this week. Um, so just send me an email. So tell me when you want to get on. And we'll work it out and we'll just do this again. All right. Thanks, Mike. I appreciate you having me on. All right. Thank you very much. And for those of you listening, thanks for taking the time to listen. Hope you have a great day, and we, of course, will talk to you tomorrow.